Hello, I'm Jason Solomons and welcome to Seen Any Good Films Lately? Did you spot the difference? Yep, a little bit of a title tweak for this new season. So we were seeing anything good lately, but now we're seeing any good films lately. So we've got the same glamorous and exciting guests sharing their movie and TV loves, still giving you bags of recommendations of what to watch, but with just a little bit more emphasis on the movies, as I've found that my guests just love remembering their film passions and experiences. So on this first episode of season two, I've got some great recommendations for you, some amazing films and titles to look out for, and a wonderful guest. The first film that I ever saw in the cinema was Jurassic Park. Yeah, I loved it. Yes, she's back. The gorgeous Stacey Martin returns after her glamorous appearance in my Venice Film Festival special of Seen Anything Good Lately. She loved it so much, she said, she just couldn't wait to get back on and share more of her viewing obsessions. Which is apt, because you can see a lot of her at the moment. She's in the British sci-fi film Archive. And on TV, she's in the gripping final episode of seductive serial killer thriller The Serpent. So we'll hear from Stacey in a bit after I tell you the answer to the question I I'm getting asked almost every day at the moment. Friends are texting me, all the WhatsApp groups have got this in it at some point. Uh, and even as I go for my morning run in the park, I get it. Oi, Jace, seen any good films lately? Apart from the TV onslaught that was Christmas, this time of year is the traditional awards season and voters uh, such as me experience a deluge of watching at this time. I'm a voter for the London Film Critics Circle, uh, which I used to be chairman of, don't you know, as well as host for the ceremony, but now I'm just a voter uh, on that body. And um, this is my first year as a fully-fledged voting BAFTA member too. So I've been wrestling with decisions and trying to get through as many films as possible in order to give everyone and everything the fairest of shots. So here's a little flavour of what I've been watching. Why are you working here? Or... I didn't mean... <laughs> that was rude. I didn't... You didn't mean, what am I doing working in a shitty coffee shop? Yeah, no, I just meant, you know... Date of birth? Friday, 31st of December, 1937. You're living with your daughter at the moment? Yes, until she goes to live in Paris. No, Dad, why do you keep going on about Paris? She told me. No, I didn't. I'm sorry, Anne, you told me the other day. Have you forgotten? She's forgotten. <laughs> Paris. They don't even speak English there. <laughs> Jenny. Carla! Carla! Right, so to run down just a few of those you'll be hearing a lot more of in the coming weeks. Uh, in there was Kerry Mulligan in Promising Young Woman, which I just thought was fresh and funny and shocking and great. It, it was just one of those breath of fresh air watches that I had. Uh, it's directed by Emerald Fennell and uh, she was showrunner on seasons two and three of Killing Eve. And this film's definitely got that, that flavour and that colour and that dark humour going on. The extraordinary Andra Day was in there as Billie Holiday uh, in the United States versus Billie Holiday. She does all her own singing uh, and well she's going to get some nominations uh, for sure because she's outstanding in a very good film the United States versus Billie Holiday coming to Sky Cinema I think in late February later this month. Judas and the Black Messiah that's excellent too. Uh, it's got Daniel Kaluuya as a young Black Panther. Uh, Fred Hampton uh, and his circle is infiltrated by an FBI in 
informant played by Lakeith Stanfield. Really stylish, very cool. Definitely the coolest film uh, out there at the moment. It uh, debuted at Sundance uh, and it should be here sometime soon. Uh, there was the towering Anthony Hopkins you heard in The Father with Olivia Coleman heartbreaking as the daughter who has to look after her father's creeping dementia. And there was also a snippet of my absolute favourite discovery of all the documentary The Truffle Hunters about the wizened Italian mushroom seekers. It is just gorgeous and it's tasty and romantic uh, an utter delight uh, every single shaving of that film is an utter delight i'm going to get the filmmakers uh, michael dweck and gregory hershaw on the show as soon as possible so i've seen them you can't yet because they're not out yet but do keep an eye out for them and get your money on them to feature in all the nominations alongside the title i reckon that has long been anointed uh, as the oscar winner which is nomadland starring Frances McDormand drifting around America in her converted van. You are one of those lucky people that can travel anywhere. Yes, ma'am. I know. And they sometimes call you nomads. My mom said that you're homeless. Is that true? No, I'm not homeless. I'm just houseless. Not the same thing, right? No. Right, so that's just a few of the things I've been watching, and we'll talk uh, some more about what I've been watching a bit later after we get my first guest on, the first guest of the new season. She's Stacey Martin, who I've had the pleasure of knowing for a few years now, ever since I was introduced to her uh, making her debut in Lars von Trier's Nymphomaniac at Cannes, and I met her at a party there. Uh, She was young and foal-like, stepping into the the glamorous world, Um, but she has seized the opportunity and seize the day and she's now occupying that very rare ground of making it in both French and English cinema where only Jane Birkin, Charlotte Rampling, Christine Scott Thomas uh, have dared to tread successfully before. So Stacey's appearing in Amon or Lovers in France. That's the one she spoke about on my Venice show when she came on that. And she's also now playing a robot in Archive, which is a British sci-fi directed by Gavin Rothery, who was a key collaborator on that excellent film Moon by Duncan Jones, uh, with Sam Rockwell in it. Remember that one? Well, in this one, Stacey plays a robot who's an AI version of a scientist's late wife, and he's trying to bring her back uh, as a robot, in robot form, to preserve the essence of his wife, the archive of her feelings and her soul. How's my man? Oh, no play, huh? I really hope you're happy there. I'm missing you. A bit. A lot. I'm working on something. To bring you back. I've never managed to connect to computers or the archive before. I waited a long time. And then I saw something. So that was Stacey in Archive. She's also in The Serpent. You've been watching that, haven't you, on iPlayer. BBC iPlayer's got Taha Rahim and Jenna Coleman in it. The story of hippie killer Charles Sobraj, who stalked the traveller routes of Thailand, India and Nepal throughout the 70s under the guise of a gem dealer. It's a very glamorous series, all that sort of Parisian styling, the floppy hats and the big glasses and the high-waisted trousers. And it's that's part of the attraction of the, the seduction of it all, that the glamorous world that they threw up in Bangkok. So Stacey's about to show up there uh, in the finale of The Serpent, looking forward to seeing what she does. So I caught up with her and asked about being a star in Britain and France, uh, all the TV and films that she loves and has loved, and what it takes to get robot ready. The process of actually becoming the robot for Archive was a three hour to four hours every morning, which I kind of took on really excitedly. And and after week one, just thought, what have I taken? (laughs) What am I doing? But it was just so interesting to go through that level of transformation before, because I'd never done anything like that. I think that they're quite interesting processes, isn't it? Because you get the words on the page when you're an actor, and then you have to 
put a body into them so they be, they become alive in a way so in in a sense you are sort of filling a a blank space with your physicality as an actress and you're sort of doing the same as a robot there but that this is about making a soul and giving it a human face but it's quite important that it is your face i mean this in the, in the most flattering terms possible it does look a bit like you you know you mm. can see your little face coming through yeah. it <laughs> yeah. i mean you're a bit prettier than that normally but you do see it in the movie uh, as well there's enough flashback of you to sort of give us the the fact that this is really your eyes and your nose and your chin yeah it gives you a hint and I think it also makes it more relatable um and there's something um so the the first phase of of J3 who I play she's just I have full prosthetics on I, I think on my face I had about two on my cheeks um, I, yeah, about four or five prosthetics. And then I had a whole sort of skull cap. And then I had what I called my earmuffs. And I could breathe and I could I could sort of open my mouth a little bit, but all expression was gone. So it was a real process of finding how J3 communicates and how she's able to feel and discover those feelings. And, and importantly enough, also how she sort of communicates those, because it's really hard when you can't smile. And I'm I'm naturally I think a lot more sort of I move a lot and I smile and and I rely on those a lot so when I first put on the J3 costume it was quite a shock because I suddenly couldn't rely on my usual or expressions or even my eyebrows like even if, if I lifted my eyebrows no one would know and I think people just got quite intimidated on set because they thought I was just not expressing anything. When She's in a right mood today. Yeah, I mean, to be fair, I was. <laughs> Probably were like, three hours in makeup. Um, yeah, but um, but it was really weird to see how people suddenly relate to you differently. I had very uh, a few lonely days, I have to say. But um, oh, was it full you. body? Could you go to the loo? No, I couldn't go to the toilet. I had those lovely neon green pants on, which I was thrilled about. I was so excited. It was like a kid meeting Santa Claus for the first time. I was like, it's like a Star Wars movie. And Gavin was like, yes, Stacey, just get on with it. <laughs> I suppose it's all dressing up, all getting into character at some point. Anyway, it's all quite useful stuff. I do want to ask you though, now that you're in, in France, and I've, I've never asked you this because I always think it's a sort of a strange question, but actually now watching back to back, you doing Archive and then they, they, they play with your voice in this. So we hear you in a different accent and then watching you in Amont, of course, doing French. The toggling between French and English as an actress. Mm -hmm. There are parts that you, you're you going to play that you have a French Stacey that can play a certain part. And then there's an English Stacey that can only play a certain part. Do you find in, uh, it, or do they, do they mix up for you and you don't know the languages that you're in uh, by a certain period of, of shooting? It really depends because I feel like I have, I'm working a lot more in France at the, well, at the moment, um, pre-pandemic. And the way that they film is so different and the way that films are written and, and set up from the get-go. So I think unconsciously that does set in my mind a different way of working, but I've never thought, oh, what would this character be like in English? If it's a French film, I kind of think it's going to be French and, and, and that's it. But there's definitely some moments where they're like, oh, maybe she should have a bit of an English accent if she's a French character. And I find I find that really confusing because it's for me, it's either one one or the other yeah um, as much as I can oscillate between American or, or any other accent ask me to do an accent of a language that I speak fluently is I think mentally really weird are you rubbish at franglais can you even do sort of uh you know cluzo type french no i'm quite good because i that's what i do with my mum oh. um she's english but she's she's more of a parisian now for all its glory and and, and disasters and we do a lot of that so you speak like this to your mum you say hello you don't yes, speak in french and then it's a uh, but i would never go into an audition and do that because for me it's a caricature yeah I find it really hard to do it seriously. I'm just like, oh, well, you know, the baguette is so good. <laughs> it just doesn't, I wouldn't be able to live with myself doing that for a project. <laughs> well, funny enough, though, I don't I haven't seen you yet in it, but The Serpent, which I am watching and I'm rather gripped by, Jenna Coleman does play, I mean, she's English as far as I'm aware, but she sort of plays a Quebecoise uh, who, does, who does speak a bit like this because she has to speak a bit like this for it. So I, 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 you, you're, you've not come into it. I've only seen three episodes yet and you're not in it yet. But it keeps, I, I keep thinking you're going to turn up at any moment. So I, maybe it's a surprise uh, when you're happening. So 
th- th- there's a, there was an example of someone who had to sort of you know do the French accent and you know but you don't actually speak like that at all you either speak English or you yeah, speak French the amazing thing about what Jenna did is that it's not French it's Quebecois mm. which is very very different she had to learn French but she had to learn it in a very specific intonation and so you can hear it when Taha speaks in French for example who plays Charles Sabrage you can hear his French which is sort of what we all know of, of French and then Jenna which is Quebecois which is a lot heavier and For someone who's English, who doesn't speak French, to put that accent on, I mean, it's mind-blowing. See what you think in The Serpent, because that's quite different as well. We're all needing things to watch, Stacey Martin, right now. And we're obsessed with it. I get texts like five times a day from people. And I say, well, just listen to my show. So I'm going to ask you, Stacey Martin, have you seen anything good lately? Last time you asked me that, you told me Selling Sunset. And you told me that then you got really embarrassed and you said, I I might hate you from now on because you told me to watch Selling Sunset. And I did watch Selling Sunset on your recommendation. But not all, yeah. not not much of it. I'm not surprised. It's, um, you were so it, into it for a bit. I, was, I watched it all, to be honest. I really got into it because it's just for me such a like a sort of social experiment. Like I and a lot of my friends, they grew up on Big Brother and stuff like that. And at that age of my life, I was in Japan, so all the reality TV stuff, I couldn't understand what they were saying. So I didn't watch all of that. So I feel like I'm kind of going through it now. I'm going selling sunset estate agents what what is this but to catch up on that dreadful recommendation (laughs) um i finally got to watch lust and caution from ang lee i hadn't seen it and i loved it interesting one yeah i haven't seen i haven't seen it since i first saw it which was i think it was at venice in 2007 something like that quite a long time ago sexy film strangely sexy erotic really erotic and i sort of i was expecting it but not at that level especially for 2007 i was like wow this is this is erotic this is is, okay and but done in a really amazing beautiful way it's sort of sexy in a way that I haven't seen before and I loved it I thought it was beautiful and really upsetting at moments but is it the Chinese it. occupation? Is it the, the, the Chinese occupation the, of Japan? That way around, I think it was, yeah. Or, yeah. yeah. It was, I mean, I haven't seen it. It was one of his least sort of celebrated ones for some reason, uh, I That's, think. Is it Tony Leung, is it, as well? He's fantastic in it, yeah. as usual, yeah. He's so good, yeah. I mean, it's like all the actors were amazing in it, and you just go, oh. We need more films like this. We need like filmmaking, like proper cinematography and like these incredible shots just for like a two second moment. Like I got really excited. Have you noticed a little, any dent? I mean, obviously right now the productions are weird and I don't know if you're working on set or doing a COVID related set yet or not. But I mean, have you noticed that like you said, that's a real lush old bit of cinema. Last caution, it feels old fashioned. And yeah. we're making so many series now. We're watching series, we're even talking about series. Have you noticed a sort of diminishing of the cinema scope that you're getting into. I mean, you, you mainly do smaller indie films, I know, but have you noticed there's a sort of pulling up of the hatches in some way, that the budgets have decreased and people's scope has got a lot smaller? I think, yeah, and I think also the way that people view cinema, I think, has really changed and, and the availability as well that that is just anyone can make a film now you can you know you can do it on an iphone you can do it on a black magic you can you don't have to have a crazy alexa and a whole crew behind you which is great but i think it also is dangerous because it means that people who i'm trying to try carefully here people who want to make a film but don't necessarily have the vision make films and you know that's great but do i really want to watch a film that's on handheld camera again and again about a social structure in in somewhere really lost in England or France like we they have their place but I don't want that to be the only thing that's being made like I want to be amazed and I want to be inspired and that sort of cinema you can only really see now in big budget films you see it in Marvel you see it in in sort of Star Wars or you see it in James Bond because they have the funds so they can do these crazy shots and they can you know pan for five hours and and it's just a shame that it's becoming such a difficult mode of, of, of working. Yeah. What was the first film you ever saw, Stacey? The first film that I ever saw in the cinema was Jurassic Park. Nice choice. Was- yeah, I loved it. Where it was, was that? It was in France and we had come back from Japan for our summer holidays and we were staying with my family and my cousin took me and 
I just remember thinking there are so many more worlds out there that I don't know. And traveling a lot as a kid already, I kind of had this sense of the world is bigger than where I am. But suddenly seeing Jurassic Park for me was like sort of opened up this imaginary world. And it just became that film that for me was like, I want to live in these worlds. Like I want to be... I want to be in Jurassic Park. Like, you know, I want to run behind, in front of a dinosaur and, and the experience of, of watching that with other people in the room, people gasping and screaming. Like, that's just so wonderful and great. Oh, that's a wonderful first film. Really good story. And I, I mean, it feels like a film that really affected you as well. But I'm going to ask you if there was a film that changed your life. I mean, that you could be in or that you uh, watched or both. I would say, I mean, I think Jurassic Park was the first film that kind of, really impressed me but I would say Breaking the Waves is the film that really had a, a sort of emotional and I think intellectual impact as well on on me as an actor and on on what I wanted to do with my life and on on just the art of cinema I think it's just such an incredible heartbreaking film and that was the moment I thought oh if I can work with one director in my life it would be Lars von Trier and little did I know I think it was maybe a year or two later I ended up working with him on my first film. It was quite bonkers. <laughs> more than a year or two later. Oh, no, you, you didn't see it. I've seen it a lot later than when it came out, mm. yeah. And you went, I want to work with him, and and then you did. I mean, that's yeah, just... It is ridiculous. I think I need to do this a bit more often, to watch a film and go, oh, if there's one director, I want to work. Mr Spielberg, <laughs> I think. <laughs> Spielberg, hello. Oh, hi, Tarantino. How are you? <laughs> <laughs> well, it obviously worked. How extraordinary. I didn't yeah. know that. But no, I mean, amazing performance from Emily Watson in there as well. Yeah. And I actually got to wear, so she wears these um, red sort of plasticky shorts um, at one point in the film and I got to wear them and I was so excited. What do you mean you got to wear them? I, we reused some of the costumes that she wore and, and we tried them on. And I was like, these are the pants that um, that she wore. And, and they're like, yeah. And I was like, I'm wearing them. This is yeah. for Nymphomaniac? In Nymphomaniac. And, and I wear them um, in the train scene. Oh, okay. I, I don't remember too much about the wearing in Nymphomaniac, to be honest with you. All right, don't worry. <laughs> Oh, I think that's amazing. Stacey, it's been wonderful talking to you as ever. Listen, I hope you get back to a set pretty soon. I don't know, if you, you, you know. What, but in the meantime, we've got so much to, coming for you. have got Lovers to Come, uh, The Serpent, which, which you're about to do. Uh, Archive is out now. And you've got two or three lined up, haven't you? What else you got coming out? Hopefully, yeah. Um, I'm going to shoot The Brutalist by Brady Corbett. That's his third feature. So we're hoping to do that this year. And you've been with him in the previous two? Yes. Um, so his last one was Vox Lurks with Natalie Portman and then his first film Childhood of a Leader um, with Robert Patterson, uh, Berenice Bijou. And I play a French cheetah in that, so that yeah. was fun. But yeah, I mean, you know, I'm sort of also just at a stage where I'm very excited to get back to work, but do I want to be working and stressed out with knowing that there's a risk of me catching the virus and, and spreading it to my loved ones? I just, I'd rather just wait at this point if I can and, and just hold on as much as, as possible and... and yeah we'll see who knows <laughs> yeah well keep safe and keep well and uh, yeah don't journey back and forth more than you need to because then it could be, yeah, be exactly. like, are you coming on the train yes yeah. i mean i hope they'll let me back i feel like it's quite intense at the moment so yeah i might be stranded here what passport do you have this is the other new thing you have to work out i have both so i i'm very lucky on that on that respect you have french and british passport now yeah. ah so you're okay for brexit yeah. will this be your first journey in the new Brexit era. Yeah. Oh. Sort of yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what it means. I don't know what it's gonna be like. I haven't I I don't know. I just know people taking people's sandwiches away from them and getting them upset. Crazy. I read that this morning. Well I my sandwiches remained intact, but um I'll let you know on the way back to England for you. <laughs> You're like that demi baguette and you'll be like, Well yeah. I couldn't finish it. <laughs> Give me the butter, please. <laughs> lovely to see you again. Thanks so much for coming on the show again with some great recommendations. Stacey Martin, lovely to see you and courage. Merci, à bientôt. À bientôt, à très bientôt. Lovely stuff from Stacey Martin. She's welcome back anytime on Seen Any Good Films Lately. Right, uh, what else have I been watching? Look, the only show in town is surely It's a Sin.
I have to say that I thought it was excellent. Shouts out to Russell T. Davis, who wrote and directed brilliantly. But shouts out to Lydia West, who plays Jill in it, and Amari Douglas, who was Roscoe in it. And I just loved both of those characters and both of their performances. Ollie Alexander, he was lovely in it too. And the whole thing was just beautifully put together. It's fun and funny. And then whack, it's heartbreaking. I loved how it was political, but mainly personal, which seemed to be about the right way of dealing with uh, the AIDS crisis between 1982 and 1988 here in London uh, and in Britain. And it follows these flatmates on their various journeys, so much so that what we really do is care about them and their fate. Uh, And for my generation, the mystery and the panic and the general atmosphere of fear and the secrecy and stigma around AIDS and, and how long it all took to be faced up to, well, that is what it got just perfectly. I loved that Paris set film from a few years ago, 120 beats per minute. I thought that was just brilliant with Adele Anel uh, in it. But It's a Sin was warmer and more relatable and closer to home. And I say that as someone who lived in, in both London and Paris while these things were going on. But It's a Sin was about the very British response to it. And I've never seen a British film or drama that really responded to AIDS and the crisis and what it was like here. And obviously coming at this time of pandemic and confusion and government obfuscation and panic, that has added poignancy. But It's a Sin is so good in its own terms, it hardly needs the sting of continued political relevance to add to its drama. It's just great as it was. Decent tunes were nice too, though. Sylvester and Patrick Cowley there, Do You Want a Funk? It features on the playlist of It's a Sin, as all of these uh, dramas now have playlists that go with them on Spotify. And uh, It's a Sin is, is an essential playlist and it's essential TV viewing all on all four. I'm still watching the new and final season of Call My Agent on Netflix, so we'll talk about that soon when I've, when I've seen a bit more of it. Uh, 30 Rock, that's still our 30-minute binge watch, catching up on that classic US sitcom, delivering 30 minutes of absolute kind of zinging joy for us, really enjoying that. And uh, well, I must mention The Dig, the film that's now on Netflix, with a great Ray Fiennes performance as Basil Brown, the Norfolk man who dug up Britain's largest treasure hall in in Suffolk at, at Sutton Hoo, the, the Saxon treasure ship that he found there. It is really good, in it, Rafe? Though sadly for me, there's not enough of him in it. And the film veers off on another less interesting love story tangent with Lily James and Johnny Flynn, which is fine and well performed and all of that. But I just wanted more Rafe and more Monica Dolan, who plays his wife in it. Uh, it's a very handsome British production all round, but just not enough Rafe. <laughs> And that's about it for the first episode of Seen Any Good Films Lately. I hope you didn't mind the tweak. I hope you spotted the changes. Um, But yeah, it's still essentially seen anything good lately. But we can't get away from films. There are just so many of them to watch right now. And uh, it's great to recommend them. And they're only going to come thicker and faster as award season progresses. I will be back next week with the next episode and with the star of One Night in Miami. That's Kingsley Ben Adir. So if you want to do some homework on that film before the next episode, it's showing on Amazon Prime and it's definitely worth watching. I promise something to furnish you with an honest answer to the question they're all asking. Seen any good films lately? (laughs) 